Uh, for our next topic, I want us to go into a little bit of depth. I know there's uh, some changes around GFCI. Alan, can you go into and explain the code change for non-dwelling units and how it's applied with the upcoming code changes? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a lot of great work that's unfolded in the GFCI uh, arena here uh, outside of dwellings for commercial and industrial. And, and, and I'm going to kick this off, but I'm going to ask you guys to kind of jump in and, and uh, uh, jump in on different pieces of this. So I'll first kick it off with, with the fact that, we've, that we've, we've done some global work. And so from a, from a correlating committee standpoint, uh, making sure that the way it's communicated and usable by the consumer or by the user of the document is important. And we have to remember that chapters one through four are, are utilized in general. So the requirements stand there for ultimately the GFCI protection in this case in 210.8 uh, are in place. And if we need to modify that for some reason, enhance it or remove it mm -hmm. uh, for whatever the case might be, we find those back in chapters five through seven. And so uh, ultimately we, we went through and we've done some work with a task group and the, and the code panels did a great job of, of aligning how that communicates back to, 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 to 2108 and, and, and helps understand that those aren't standalone requirements back in five, six, and chapters five, six, six, and seven. Those are modifying that. And so that language that was done back there, I think, did a great job. So with that, why don't we kind of kick this off? And I, and I think the first one here is, the first change here is really around kitchens in non-dwelling units. Now, uh, in the, the non-dwelling areas, that's been a leading area, quite frankly, for GFCI protection. It, it was probably the first to lead us into some of the 250 volt uh, protection because of, uh, of some incidents that unfolded there, unfortunate incidents that unfolded there. But now we have a lot of kitchens with bistros and, and cafes and, and delis that may not have permanent provisions for cooking, right? And so the definition of a kitchen uh, generally involves permanent provisions for cooking. So the code panel here wanted to make sure that when we had sinks and water and food prep and that hazard around the appliances being used in that space that we were still protected from the electrical hazard for those users around electricity. So this expanded to include areas where sinks and permanent provisions for food preparations is happening and may not have that per per permanent provision for cooking. So I think this is a good addition or a good clarification to make sure we're picking up those spaces as well. I, I think a good example of that would be a coffee shop that just has you know a stainless steel table and a sink. That's going to be addressed here in 210.8B6. You don't have to have the cooking. You know, but if you have a sink and cooking, you're going to need GFCI. If you have a sink and a permanent provision for food preparation, you know, dealing with muffins or donuts or something like that, then you're going to need GFCI. Other examples could be maybe an ice cream parlor or a, uh, a Slurpee shop, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and, you know, the next area in this series of GFCI changes is to adding damp to uh, to include both damp and wet location areas. And, you know, common areas you see today are these locations where you have uh, pet washing stations where you can reserve and self-wash. And uh, there's receptacles in these areas for, for dryers and different, uh, you know, different appliances to be used. And so those are examples. But damp and wet locations that are indoor now will clearly have GFCI protection because, again, the hazard is the same. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the key here. You, as we move on, we, what we're doing is we're continually identifying where those hazards exist. We don't you know, necessarily get it all right the first time. The next piece that we'll take a look at is in 210.8B11. There's a new list item there. And again, other than dwelling units would be laundries. So if you've got a laundromat, you've got receptacles, everything needs to be GFCI protected. We also address in 210.8B12 bathtubs and shower stalls and that's going to be within six feet of the outside edge of a bathtub or a shower stall. Again, you know, we're recognizing as Chad just pointed out, the hazards are the same. You know, let's protect people with GFCI protection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and unfortunately we have some incidents and deaths in, in these locations that sort of prompted this. Right, absolutely. I mean, those are the unfortunate pieces, but we don't want those to happen again, right? So. Uh, we, we saw a lot of, uh, well, we saw a number of 
deaths from kids, unfortunately. Uh, one climbing in the dryer, one chasing a pet behind the dryer, uh, which prompted the, prompted the dryer requirement, right? And uh, we also saw another one uh, around the HVAC system, which is a residential one, but not, not particularly in, in, in this requirement for the commercial segment. Uh, but Code Panel 2 uh, often, often acts on that particular information to make sure that protection's in place and we won't see that happen again. Yeah, as we saw the, uh, the requirements for GFCI expand to include appliances over the last couple of cycles, uh, Section uh, 210.8D merges and provides reference over to uh, Section 422.5, and that's where you'll find a, a list and the specific requirements that relate to the appliances dealt with in that article. And the GSEI can, of course, be provided by the branch circuit, but also when you get up there in Article 422, you have situations where it can be an integral part of the court assembly to provide that uh, GFCI protection and get it done for uh, appliances such as vending machines and, and others. Yeah, Mike, I think there are a number of methods that are listed there, that the ways you can accomplish GFCI protection there. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's key to make sure that that GFCI tester piece is accessible, right? The, whether it's a receptacle or integral to the cord that you can actually perform the required testing of the GFCI functionality. That's, that's a really, really big piece. And just keep in mind that 422.5, when it addresses GFCI protection, it doesn't tell you receptacle outlet or outlet. It says this equipment needs to be GFCI protected. So you need to figure out at the rough end stage and when you're buying your equipment, how you're gonna get that done. And also keep in mind that 422.5 addresses that equipment that's supplied at 150 volts or less, 60 amps or less. Mm -hmm. So that's gonna cover a lot of equipment. Absolutely. When we move on to 210.8E, uh, deals with equipment requiring servicing. And this is your 21063 application where the receptacle has to be provided for servicing uh, HVAC equipment. And the same change happened here that happened in residential. It, uh, it really applies indoor and outdoor. And the GSCI requirement is uh, certainly necessary in these locations for these types of operations to protect workers performing servicing of that type of equipment. Mm 